Welcome once again to a lecture for African American fiction. Uh, I'm your host, as ever, Mr. McKenzie. Uh, we're talking today about stereotypes, and that's going to set up our work with poetry. But we're going to be broad enough in this lecture to be talking most specifically about uh, how poetry and how literature in general confronts the assumptions that we have when we look at stereotypes. Now, by the end of this lecture, you should know the origins and the effects of stereotypes. You should be able to understand the role that literature and poetry play in confronting stereotypes. And you will have to try to determine for yourself how effectively poetry works to undermine stereotypes. Again, I like to structure this with some specifics and some basics, knowing, some more in-depth things like understanding, and leave you with something to think about, leaving you to determine for yourself. One final point. Let's start out with doing what we would do if I wasn't giving this lecture. If you were on your own and I asked you to research and think about stereotypes, where would you go? If you're a basic human being and nowadays, you probably Google it. So, what would it come up with if we put in some key phrases about different types of people, different standards of people into Google? If we were to ask Google, you know, why are Americans... Oh, oh, how thoughtful. Google is going to answer that question for us. Why are Americans so stupid, obese, rude, ignorant, loud? These are the things that are stereotypically American. And the truth is, thanks to Google's algorithms, you can see it for a whole range of people. It seems that we believe that Asians are smart, really smart, it's up there twice. We also see some other smaller things, including physical appearance. With Hispanics, we're looking more at families. Parents, their families, and, well, apparently some people like the men. English teachers are a whole different race of people, and obviously we're mean and liberal and weird. You know me, you know that's true. But when it comes to black people, it's interesting to see what terms come up. Again, it's the noise, it's the, it's the perception of work ethic, and it's the assumption about perceived abilities. In all of these Google searches, we're seeing stereotypes at play that are held in the wider culture. Your computer and Google are not racist. Your computer and Google are only using the algorithm that they've often used for other people who are searching things based on what most people put into the internet, put into Google. Those are the things that they come to assume you're going to ask about. These are the stereotypes that are at play in our natural subconscious. Now, where do these stereotypes start? Well, it starts when you observe a phenomena. You see something happen. Once you see that happen, you begin to understand and to process it. When you see certain phenomena repeated or certain common phenomena coming up again and again, you start to identify what are some common traits for this. And as you begin to de determine the common traits of similar phenomena, you subconsciously develop an expectation or a belief. That's kind of complicated. So why don't I give you an example? Here's how a stereotype can be created. Growing up in Montana, I did not encounter a lot of African Americans. The African Americans I did encounter were largely those on TV, playing sports. And I grew up loving basketball, so I watched basketball games. And I can clearly remember sitting down to watch Pistons, Bulls in the 1990s, cheering on Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, and not liking the fact that Dennis Rodman and Isaiah Thomas seemed to play dirty, and that's what I watched. But as time went on and I watched more basketball games, and I watched Jordan play the Los Angeles Lakers and Magic Johnson, and I watched him play the Blazers and Clyde Drexler, and I watched Carl Malone play, and I watched... Uh, more and more basketball games, and I saw observations confirm that African-American men didn't live in my hometown, didn't go to my store or my churches or my school, but they played basketball. So the assumption can be created that that's what African-American men do. Absent other information, you can create a stereotypical assumption. This is the danger of stereotypes, is that they're bred out of ignorance. 
And it would have been very easy for me as a young person growing up to rest myself with one simple stereotypical assumption of what African-American men were. And I'm very grateful that my parents, my family, people I knew challenged me to think of things in other ways. Now, before we settle this whole thing, it's worth thinking about some of the kinds of stereotypes. There's been a great bit of study done by uh, scholars, including uh, the stereotype content model. And this comes out of a study from 2002. And what it says is it sort of tries to base our sense of stereotypes on warth, warmth and the perception of competence. You see that here in this chart, with warmth on the left going across and competence above going down. Not all stereotypes are racist in nature, and not all stereotypes are seen as hateful or seen as negative. You can have a high warmth, high admiration stereotype, like the fact that a number of Indian immigrants are doctors. We come to this assumption that people from the subcontinent of India are smart and intelligent enough that they are gifted enough to be doctors. How wonderful for that. It's admiration. That's where it comes from. Now, if we have high, if we have a high sense of competence, but a low feeling of warmth, we end up with envy. This is what's played into anti-Semitic senses of Jewish people as being cheap or wealthy. High perception of competence, they are very good at managing money and being intelligent and fiscally responsible, but low feeling of warmth towards the group creates envy. Now, a low feeling of competence, a feeling of low competence, but a feeling of great warmth can lead to a paternalistic stereotype. This is the stereotype that you might see in certain teachers who assume that students can't do it themselves. They can't get it done themselves because situations and life circumstances are just too difficult. But boy, I want you to do well. You can't do well on your own, so I'll go ahead and pass you because I feel like you deserve to be passed. That's a paternalistic attitude and a paternalistic stereotype. Now, if you have low warmth, and a low perception, you have contempt. A contemptuous stereotype looks at people and sees them as inferior or unequal. This was where we might hear the phrase welfare queens, people that we see as taking rather than contributing or, or being part of the community in a positive way. Now all these stereotypes are, exist in our world. That's something that's just a fact. But we don't often think about what is the effect that these stereotypes have. One thing that happens is that stereotypes, if left alone, ingrain prejudice and develop a discriminatory practice. Families begin to hear it, begin to see it, and they simply allow it to continue and maintain and to fester until what is at first a stereotype becomes a prejudice and a feeling of anger that's permanent and lead to discriminatory practices that are again passed on from generation to generation. It also entrenches deficit assumptions as norms. We assume that there is a certain thing that certain kinds of people will do, that girls will wear pink. We assume that girls will avoid playing with the blocks. We assume these things. We entrench them as a norm and that this is what should happen. And it also allows us to isolate and separate different groups. This is the big sort idea that's uh, from a recent nonfiction piece by Bill Bishop. It allows us to sort each other into these different groups. We keep ourselves ignorant, we take ourselves away from each other. And that's how we continue to have segregated and striated communities, because we have these stereotypes that certain people have certain situations, and when we ingrain them and we don't acknowledge them, we allow ourselves to develop a prejudicial or separated society. Now, literature and art have to deal with stereotypes because the writers have their own stereotypes that they play with. Sometimes these are stereotypes that are used for purpose or point to make fun or mock. Sometimes they're just there. But how exactly do they turn out? How does literature try to address a stereotype, for instance? Well, we can use the stereotype. We can play off of the idea, for instance, that people who are witches or people who are interested in the Wiccan philosophy are evil, maniacal, diabolical, mean-spirited, hook-nosed, warty. We can have that stereotype and enhance the stereotype's power. Literature, media, film can confirm stereotypes that you have 
and encourage you to hold on to them for longer than you might otherwise. But literature can also challenge our assumptions. If we look at a diverse array of, of reality, the diverse opinions and presentations that people have, we start to challenge our assumptions. For instance, people who believe in the Wiccan faith serve our country in war, as apparently as uh, Sergeant Patrick Dana Stewart did. We can understand, therefore, that what we assume to be true, that witches are sorcerers and diabolical and evil and mean-spirited, is fundamentally untrue. But that's only if we have a diverse reality reflected within the literature. If the literature only reflects stereotypes, we can't get past it. Ultimately, it comes down to the readers. Those who read the literature have to confirm or in, have to confirm their stereotype, or if it's challenged enough, we'll start to investigate the assumption. Again, using that example of witchcraft, students who read about witches and wizards who do things that are positive may look at it a little bit more and decide that either that it's right for them or wrong for them, or may do something else entirely. By the same token, the example I used before about me watching basketball as a kid growing up in Montana, when that's challenged by seeing presentations of, say, movies and television wherein African Americans are doctors and lawyers, where they are uh, hardworking, responsible, family-oriented individuals who, frankly, have not a lot of talent on the basketball court, as Chris Rock's very fond of saying in his very in stand-up activities and in his sitcoms, he plays up that stereotype as a comic effect, that he is not that style. Once you're able to be exposed to that idea in contrast, you're able to challenge the assumptions and investigate for yourself that ultimately witchcraft is simply an idea, and the stereotype that all African Americans play basketball is fundamentally unsound. That's the strength of literature. But we'll see those stereotypes still present themselves in literature whether we're going to confront them or deal with them or not. We see them in the characters that are presented. Overly stereotyped mammy presentations, for instance, or who are cooking and cleaning and doing things with aprons, becomes a stereotypical character that we see. We see it in their actions, so having certain cultures represented with a warrior motif, as is the case with Native Americans. As you can see in a variety of Native Americans playing themselves up in video games as combat-oriented. And we see it in speech especially in literature and text. The language that's used can often confirm and embed a stereotype within our mindset, as is the case for this Italian character in a Walt well, Disney cartoon. We see the stereotypical language, the stereotypical presentation and look with a mustache, a, a knit kerchief, a, a, excuse me, a patched shirt. These are things that we see confirming our racial stereotype. Again, as I pointed out previously on the previous slide, we can use those stereotypes that we see in the characters and their speech and their actions to enhance the power and embed them. Or if we challenge them enough, if they're diverse enough, if they're realistic enough, as we've seen in some of the recent literature, we can challenge that assumption. Ultimately, it's going to come back to the readers to confirm or investigate those assumptions. Now allow us to consider the power of poetry. Most of the examples I just gave you were examples that came from uh, narrative literature. Plays, films, television, and novels. Even a comic strip. But poetry is different. And poetry has a particular power and prominence within the world of African American literature. Think about the history of poetry in African American literature. It starts with the idea of orality and folk stories in poetic forms. And it's also naturally a sense of musicality. Like the first picture you saw there was Homer, the great Greek bard who is considered by many to likely have been African American. He's considered a Nubian in many ways, as someone who came up through North Africa into Greece. The folk stories that we hear passed on in generations I covered previously in our literary, in our education podcast, uh, not podcast, excuse me, in our education video. And that's also reified in the sense of what Native, what excuse me, what African American slaves performed in terms of their musicality. The idea that during work or during time incarcerate in incarceration, they would sing away their troubles. The orality continued and carried on, and the music uh, 
became something that was embedded within our sense of the culture. In some ways, musicality is a stereotype for African Americans. However, that's not the only way in which poetry is valuable. As we can see in a number of other places, including the Harlem Renaissance and jazz poetry featuring County Cullen and Langston Hughes. Now, the Harlem Renaissance and jazz poetry is a movement of African of poetry that's commonly related to African Americans, given its relationship to Harlem and uh, African Americans' relationship to jazz and musicality again. But we see these things play themselves out most fully in the literature of the late 1920s and early 1930s. And it's created through a migration that happened for a lot of African Americans to unite themselves in northern urban centers where there was more work available. The Harlem Renaissance and jazz poetry encourage African Americans to celebrate their racial heritage and also to take social stands to resist racism, poverty, and the perceived fate of a disastrous future. Now, in jazz poetry in particular, there's a wide variety of ways to express yourself. There's an experimentation, and again, there's an inherent musicality to things. This is where lyricism, songwriting, really begins to become more powerful and prominent and allows there to be a greater sense of reality. But the poets themselves provide the words, provide the language, provide the great music, and divert a stronger independent movement of writers and poets. Now, the Harlem Renaissance is not where African American poetry ends. We also have the Black Arts Movement, led by Amiri Baraka, who passed away earlier this year, and Maya Angelou. Now, the Black Arts Movement moves a little bit farther away from the experimentation genre that we might see in jazz poetry, but holds on to some of the things that are common in jazz poetry, including the musicality, including a sense of the value of structure, but also incorporates some of those elements that still hold on from Harlem Renaissance, like exploring culture and history. But in this case, they look for you to do that within yourself. Now, this is a movement that really gets going in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and it's rooted in the civil rights movement and in the black power movement. There's a lot of animosity and some anger that's perceived within the black arts movement. And it's criticized for that reason as being something that may isolate or segregate African American writers from other groups. The sense is oftentimes that there's a negative connotation within African American culture against, with, excuse me, within African American poets in the black arts movement against different groups that they perceive to be rivals rather than commonly, in, commonly united. But most of that is based on the simple fact that the black arts movement is focused on, again, the self and exploring culture and your history by exploring yourself and developing your own personal identity. This is greatly shown in the work of Maya Angelou as she's able to work and weave herself through not only the civil rights movement, but also the feminist movement. Her work in particular is something that is very particular and very openly honest for herself and her own experiences. Now, in the 1990s, we have yet another movement in African-American poetry, and that's slam poetry. Slam poetry has its origins in the 1990s in the New York Poets Cafe of New York. And what it ends up doing is it ends up being a more poetic, more literary form of something that begins in the, in the late 1970s, moving through the musicality into hip-hop. 1980s and 1990s again reaffirm this. And it re-emphasizes the orality in performance, something that hip-hop allows us to do, making poetry inherently musical by itself, and that slam poetry allows us to do by taking the orality and making poetry, again, an oral activity. Not something that's studied on college campuses or away in a library, but something that's done in the street, something that's done in a community, something that's done together. And again, slam poetry and hip-hop share the fact that they are politically opinionated and often inspired by injustices. I know that we have an entire spoken word class devoted to slam poetry, so my course is going to only contain hip-hop specific poems. So you'll see still some writers who, like Common, have a great deal of poetic style and poetic maturation that's influenced their lyricism and influenced their style of communication. In all, slam poetry and hip-hop maintain some of the traditions of poetry within African American literature, maintaining that musicality, re-emphasizing the orality that we see in the very earliest ages of African-American storytelling and poetry, and using the political opinionation that's inspired by injustices to hold on to one's racial identity. But now, all of that background leads us to think about this.
how is our poetry confronting stereotypes? Po the pro side here, I'm not sure if pro is the really the right way I want to describe it, but that's the best phrase I could come up with. The positive ways in which poetry confronts and actively challenges stereotypes is by being a universal piece. Within film, television, fiction, those are areas that are often associated with an historical literacy model and an education model that I've talked about before as being embedded in whiteness. Poetry is a universal. It's a song. It's a style that's passed on through generations and is there in every culture that we can find. Every culture has some musical elements within it, has some spoken dialect within it, has a poetic root to it. So it's something that's accessible, not just for African Americans, but for everyone. We talked previously about how certain African American films and television might seem like they are not accessible, how you might not see a white audience at them. But poetry is accessible to everyone. You don't have to be African American to engage with an African American poet. Poetry is also enhanced in terms of its emotional impact. And these emotions can be shared by everyone. The feeling of injustice, the feeling of anger, the feeling of frustration, the feeling of love, the feeling of passion, compassion, interest in other people. That emotional core is there in poetry far more than it is in the narrative style of literature. Poetry also allows a more open use of language, which we talked about last week. We talked about the importance of speaking one's own language. And poetry encourages people to use the language that they are familiar with, they are comfortable with. It's supposed to be spoken, and you're supposed to be able to speak it comfortably and well. Poetry also allows people to address both tradition and modern society. Embedded as it is in African American past and present, how, how some of the most prominent African American writers, poets, and the most prominent African American poet movements are tying into both one's racial heritage and the injustice and issues of the modern age. That's some of the power of poetry. But there are some difficulties that poetry faces when it tries to confront stereotypes. Because it's universalized, Oftentimes, people want poetry to minimize race. They want race to be removed almost entirely from the situation and for it to just be about situations and issues that are universal. That seems to be an injustice, perhaps, to the writer, but that makes it difficult for what I said before, the universality, to really be felt. If you aren't willing to feel that you can be universally connected to other people of different races, you want them just to minimize the race. And some poets need to, in fact, do that themselves. They feel that they have to minimize their race. Another con is that it can enhance stereotypes. For instance, the emotionality element is something that's often seen as a negative element of African American culture, that they are too emotional. This is a misconception, obviously, but if there's a lot of emotion within an African American poet, that's seen as well, obviously. Again, enforcing an ignorant and unfortunate stereotype, but enhancing that stereotype nevertheless. The same thing holds true for, as I mentioned, the musicality element. The fact that people believe that African Americans are more musical than other people enhances the stereotype because they're seen as being left to poetry. And the more we think about what is naturally a strength for African Americans, the more we, be, we allow ourselves to permit and inspire a condescending stereotype that that's what you're capable of. And we like that, but that's all that you're capable of. And that, again, is the condescending stereotype that I talked about at the beginning. Above all else, it really leads to the creation of a limitation. Maybe thinking that you have to be black, that you have to fit into one of these movements, that you are going to be poetic rather than a narrative writer. It leads to all kinds of issues and challenges as well. But that more or less deals with the structure of poetry rather than with the actual content of poetry. The cons are maybe the poetic structure and form that's seen as stereotypical, but the pros can be found within the internal pieces of the poems themselves. Of course, if we have a negative perception of language and how African Americans use language that's not mainstream English, you know what? I'm thinking about this plenty myself. The question is there really, what do you think about it? And that's where we need to review. So, think again. Where do stereotypes begin? Oh, come back. Come back. <laughs>
This is not in the cards. Give me a second. We. Let's review. Ah, oh, I love when, when I make mistakes. Stereotypes begin as observations, right? And the observations become assumptions and allow us to entrench ignorance. That's the real effect that they have. Now, literature and poetry use characters, actions, speech, and language. And remember that. The speech and language. Poetry being oral might not have characters, might not have people giving actions, but boy, oh boy, it has the use of language. And those are what we use to contribute to and alter stereotypes. Ultimately, it's up to you to determine how effectively you think it challenges and alters stereotypes. Now, I'm done. Thanks.